But, um, yes, yeah, so like you said, so let's go into college football. The opening story for us that we both agree on is Texas A&M and how well they did play in South Carolina. So, yes, how bad South Carolina looks, but we can talk about how good A&M's offense looks. Um, yes. To yes. me, it looks like the Browns should have hired Kevin Sumlin instead of drafting Johnny Manziel. If you You're right. <laughs> You're but, right. Um, <laughs> the, but the big story here is the Texas A&M quarterback, Kenny Hill. Obviously, he is replacing Johnny Manziel. And how is he How is he going to perform? Well, I'll tell you how he's going to perform. He broke Johnny Manziel's single-game passing record by throwing for 511 yards. Stanko, he threw 60 times. He completed 44 passes, and he connected with 12 different receivers for three touchdowns. This guy was unstoppable. Yeah, he he was out, out of this world. 44 for 60 passing, as you mentioned, 511 yards and three touchdowns. Had a couple scrambles in there as well. And he said his main concern was the press conference after the game. That's what he was most nervous about. He wasn't nervous <laughs> about the game. He was most nervous about the press conference and speaking to the media, in which he made it known that he does not like the nickname Kenny Football. So that nickname will not stick, because that was trending on Twitter during the game. It will not stick. <laughs> what, what yeah, I, I saw that. He said, he said that, the, that the A&M fans need to come up with something more clever. Yeah, so, but I think what was trending on uh, during this game that last Thursday was Johnny Who, hashtag Johnny Who. How does Johnny Manziel feel now, knowing that people are saying, maybe it wasn't Johnny Manziel that was so special, maybe it was Kevin Sumlin as the head coach that made Johnny Manziel so good. I think that puts a lot of, a lot of shadow of doubt over Johnny Manziel in the NFL. He was playing a preseason game while this game was going on. Um but I think Kevin Sumlin comes out of this game looking like an absolute genius. Uh, the Aggies ran 99 offensive plays for 680 total yards. That's oh. insane. And like we said, this is against a team that was ranked in the top 10. You're going on their into their uh, place on their home field and doing that type of performance. Danko, it raises the question, is A&M contenders – for this new playoff system this year. Listen, the SEC is so tough. But And South Carolina, I think they're a good defense. I don't think they're great. I think that they kind of underestimated the presence of Jadavion Clowney. Him not being there, I think they underestimated what that would do. Because uh, I think I think last year he just he created so much attention made their whole defense better. But I think they're a good defense. I want to see what Texas A&M will do against a very, very good defense like an LSU like in Alabama, something like that. But if this if this is a litmus test, the SEC and the nation better watch out because if Kenny Hill puts up two thirds of the numbers that he put up against South Carolina, he's going to be a high pick contender, and Texas A&M is going to be fantastic. And what I think is also most impressive is that Texas A&M was one of the worst defensive teams last year. Johnny Mendel had to score forty points a game to win. They held South Carolina, which is a pretty good offense to only 28 points, of, and a couple of those points came in garbage time of when the game was already out of hand. So I think also credit's got to go to the Texas A&M defense for showing up and playing pretty well. And if this Texas A&M, def- if this Texas A&M team has a defense to go along with that dynamic of an offense, this nation better watch out because they are very, very good. Yeah, it just makes the SEC that much tougher because obviously going in, no one really thought about A&M doing that much damage and creating this much of a buzz after week one. Granted, we should see uh, we should see what what's going to happen next week. But I mean, if this is any sign of what A and M is going to be, you really, really got to watch out because they are certainly a team that's going to be tough to beat. Yeah, looking at their schedule next week, they have Lamar, and then they have Rice, and then they're at SMU. So not three uh, games that aren't really uh, tests, if you will, to their uh, to their. You know, they put up fifty-two points on South Carolina. What yeah. are they going to do to Lamar? I I don't want to know. I really I don't want to know. I I don't. I want. I don't know what the line's going to be that game. Over under. I mean, what's the line going to be? Forty five. The line's points. probably going to be forty. I mean, yeah, it's nuts. Um, but I think I think the test will come starting September twenty seventh when they when they host Arkansas and then they're at Mississippi State. Then they go. Then they have Ole Miss and then Alabama. So then they get into the meat of the SEC. Uh, and they end their season 
at Auburn and then playing Missouri and LSU. So they end their season with three tough games. Oh, oh man, um, that is such a tough end of the schedule. I'll tell you what, though, if A&M has, a, has one of these types of special seasons, I'm not even saying, even if they don't make it to the to the Final Four, I guess we'll call it, um, I Kevin Sumlin, he got NFL looks. Like I said, he he got a look at the Browns head coaching job this past year. Uh, let's see if he stays at A and M a little longer, or if he makes a jump to the NFL. Yeah, I mean he he seems like an offensive guru and a quarterback whisperer. So he he seems to have yeah, figured himself a little niche there at Texas A and M. Seems to be doing quite well. Uh, but let's Mike, let's move on to our second highlighted game. Uh, it features number one ranked Florida State, who was in prime time on ABC against Oklahoma State, and this game was a lot closer than people thought. Florida State only comes out with a six-point win, 37-31. to 31. I mean, the Cowboys gave them, a, gave them a pretty tough game. Yeah, they did give them, they gave them a tough game. It must have been the uh, place that they played, and the Cowboys were playing in the Dallas Cowboys Stadium. So that That's right, Jerry game. Jones' house, yep. <laughs> but Jameis Winston, he looked off in the first half. I just think Oklahoma State really threw a different type of defense that I guess Jameis Winston's used to, a lot of protection. Uh, it looked like they gave him a, a lot more time than I thought they were going to. They didn't rush him that much. They had him sit back and actually kind of make a decision uh, on where to throw it. Cause he, uh, and it worked. Jameis Winston threw two interceptions. Uh, he, Like I said, he looked lost in the first half. But, um, but when push came to shove, Florida State really made plays on offense. My main concern is their defense. Last year, they were third in total defense at the end of the year when they won the national championship. Third yep. in total defense. They give up 31 – Oklahoma State puts 31 points on them. So it's not – I'm not really worried about Florida State's offense. I'm more worried about their defense. Because Oklahoma State's putting up 31 points, how else – like how are other teams going to perform? Yeah, and you got to look 161 rushing yards for the Cowboys as well. So they were pretty dominant on the ground throughout the game. Uh, averaging nearly four yards to carry. Um, well, I think Jameis Winston, I agree with you. He didn't, he didn't play that well. He really didn't. Uh, he passed 40 times, 25 for 40. That's 370 yards. That's a lot of yards, but two interceptions. Uh, but 203 of his 370 yards went to one receiver, Rashad Green, who was returning from last year. That's, I mean, 203 yards went to one guy. If Florida State wants to be successful the rest of the season, they're going to have to spread that wealth out because if you're going to get the good defense with a good second who's just going to key in on that one guy, James Wiss is not going to have anyone to throw the ball to. So I think that's another area of concern for the Seminoles. Yeah, that's a great point. I mean, he obviously 200 yards is phenomenal for one receiver. But did you see Jameis Winston's run? His oh, my God. run was so nice. He, it really looked like a play out of Maddox. So, it, it, I mean, it was a run, jumped over, he jumped over his own guy. It was his own guy, correct? Yeah. Did, did you see the guy duck down because he knew you saw him jumping over him? Yeah, he was about to, yeah, the guy Yeah, the guy on offense was about to, like, stand up, saw him duck down, and then Seamus Winston hit the next guy with an okie doke, hit left trigger, went left, and he was out. Yeah. It reminded me more of NFL Street because the moves were just so quick. That it was, it was just like, doo, 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 and he was just gone into the end zone. Uh, 28-yard run. Uh, it was not number one on ESPN top ten, and I was very surprised. I thought ESPN would have been into the into the social media hype and made it number one, uh, but they didn't. I think it was number five or six. Uh, but oh wow, still an unbelievable run. It, that was a highlight of the game for him. Uh, really was. Yeah. But then on the next drive. Uh, J.W. Walsh from Oklahoma State has his own little scramble and runs into the end zone and answers Florida State's touchdown with one of his own. So I, w- I was impressed with J.W. Walsh, a quarterback for Oklahoma State. I thought he, I thought he did pretty well uh, leading his team against what was supposed to be a very good defense. And, listen, the Cowboys were 19-point underdogs. The only lose by six uh, on a giant stage to the number one ranked team defending champions. Mm-hmm. I think Oklahoma State – I come out of that game. Sure, disappointed they didn't win, but pretty happy with the way their team played and how that looks for the rest of the season. Yeah, absolutely. Just uh, to touch on Florida State's wide receivers, uh, it was announced that uh, their one of their wide receivers, uh, Bobo Wilson, he had an indefinite suspension, but it was just lifted, um, so he'll be able to play next game. 
Um, he got he got wrapped up in the summer for a, for a couple of misdemeanors, so now he is now eligible to play. I think he it was, he was a theft of a scooter, and um, so now okay. he he can play. He was a freshman last year, only had three receptions, but they say he's supposed to get more time this year. So maybe with at least Bobo Wilson able to play, that might open up for another receiver. So who knows how. Uh, that lift suspension will benefit uh, Jameis Winston, but you got to figure any wide receiver that can get on the field is going to benefit Jameis Winston. Yeah, and Florida State next week, they are able to solve all their problems because they host Citadel, so that, that will be okay. Uh, and then they host Clemson, who's ranked 16, but they lost week one, so they will drop. Uh, and then they really kind of have a – a fairly easy schedule, I guess you could say. I mean, it's the ACC. They're not a strong football conference right now. Um, so we'll, we'll see what happens with Florida State. Some question marks were raised. I'm curious to see if they'll be number one in the new coaches poll because teams like Oregon looked really, really good, and Georgia was incredibly impressive as well. So I'm curious to see where, where they land. I think they'll still retain number one, but I think more question marks were raised than answers were given uh, for the Seminoles. Yeah, I mean, I agree. Um, I think the difference with Florida State now is last year all, everyone was talking about Alabama. Everyone was talking about Auburn. And Georgia was very good. And you had all these teams that were kind of fighting and fighting in the SEC. And then all of a sudden, kind of Florida State came out of nowhere towards the end of the season, and then they were getting talked about. Now they were preseason number one, Jameis Winston, Heisman Trophy winner. So the target's on their back. They, they are known now. They are on the schedule for these teams, and they are the team to beat, and everyone's looking at them. So I think that's kind of the difference. Their mindset's a little different. They're not that hungry, you know, we'll show them type of team this year like they were last year because they weren't really getting respected as much because no one really thought they were an ACC team. They didn't play in the SEC. They didn't play as good of a schedule. So no one really thought that Florida State would be as good as they were to win the national championship last year. So now that their target is on their back this year, and people know about Jameis Winston, and people know about Jimbo Fisher and his squad. Let's see how they're gonna. Let's see how they're gonna kind of counter counteract uh, these teams coming at them even harder now. Yeah, it's, it's a completely different mindset for them this season. So it'll be interesting to see how they do. Though I think they'll take care of business against Citadel. I think we can bank on that. <laughs> it's safe to say they might. They, they they might squeak one out against Citadel. Yeah, they might do that. Uh, but our third and our our final uh, highlight game for college football for me, was the best game of Saturday. It was number 13 LSU defeating number 14 Wisconsin 28-24. to LSU had to come back from down 17 points to win this game, but they're able to pull it out due to the guttiness of Les Miles. Uh, but for me, this was the best game this Saturday. I don't know about you, but it was, it was goddamn entertaining. Yeah, I mean, by far, I think this was the most entertaining game. It was the Closest game, uh, Wisconsin. I think it was twenty-four to seven at one point. Exactly. They were up and they were and they were moving the ball. They were just doing everything they wanted against West Mile squad. But to me, it just proves how much quicker SEC teams are over Big Ten teams. They, oh the LSU was just on a roll after it. Was, I think it was midway through the third quarter is when they really started to get going. And I think the biggest play was I think LSU was down. They were they might have been down 11, and they converted a third and 21 from the Wisconsin 36 yard line. And I think it was the guy DRC. I think that's how you say it. Yeah, uh, the wide receiver. It was just kind of a dump off pass, and he broke three tackles and high stepped a fourth guy to get into the end zone. I think that was really the turning point. Um, it was like I said, midway through the third quarter, they get in the end zone there. They convert the two point conversion, and all of a sudden it's a three point game. And I think from there, they just I, I don't think uh, Wisconsin really had an answer. Third and 21 on, on Wisconsin's 36-yard line, and LSU came up with a score there. Yeah, LSU played terrible in the first half. They only had 136 offensive yards in the first half, 80 of those coming on one big touchdown play. So if you think about it, they only had 56 yards the rest of the half besides that one play, which is it's atrocious for LSU um, and, and less miles. However, the team finishes with 369 yards, so they finished, they figured out their problem in the second half. And the game turned around on a less miles fake punt. Of course it does. Because <laughs> less miles, 
the Mad Hatter turns it around with that. And I, listen, that's one of the reasons I love Wes Miles because he coaches like you play Madden. That, that, that's the way I describe him. You know what? You know what? I'm not going to punt it. I'm going to go for it. It's fourth and 20. Screw it. We're going to make it happen. And then he makes it happen somehow. I'm going to trivia a question for you. What is Les Miles' record when trailing in the fourth quarter? Les Miles' record. In his Wait, entire career. Is his record with being down in the fourth quarter? Being down in the fourth quarter. Wow. Uh, I don't even know. He is 22-21 and 21 in his career when trailing in the fourth quarter. Think about that. More than half the time the team is trailing in the fourth quarter, he comes back and wins. That's, that's fantastic. That's, that's remarkable. That's fantastic. And also, just a little tidbit with Les Miles, because I'm sure he had something to do with this. LSU was penalized for leaving the locker room uh, after halftime late. So they were penalized for, for not coming out on time. And I'm sure Les Miles had something to do with it by getting in their team's ear after a lackluster performance in the first half. Yeah, and uh, now LSU extends their forty extends their non conference winning streak uh, to forty six games, which is a record right now. Um, so I mean LSU, I think I think they're a team that's pretty dangerous. I think people are kind of sleeping on them a little bit in the SEC. But what's also interesting is for Wisconsin, uh, running back Melvin Gordon played pretty well in the first half, and he opened up the second half with a sixty three yard run that ended up being Wisconsin's final score. But for the rest of the game, Gordon only received two more carries. And this was a, this was a guy who was kind of a, a figure of their offense in the first half. He had, he had, I believe he had 13 carries in the first half. But he only had three in the second half. And a Wisconsin head coach, Gary Anderson, said Gordon had a scenario at halftime that made it doubtful whether the Sarps tailback could return to the game. He did not. Uh, this is from ESPN. ESPN then goes on. He did not elaborate, and Gordon did come back late in the game to provide pass protection. And then after the game, Gordon was asked if he tweaked anything and was injured, and Gordon responded, nah, I was good, man, all good. So I just think it's interesting that your starting running back, who starts off the second half with that dynamic touchdown run, only gets two more carries in very limited minutes the rest of the game. I'm curious to know what happened at halftime that made that happen. That's a great point. It's a great point, and obviously people are going to be questioning that, especially after a loss like Wisconsin had. That is a uh, that's a fantastic point, and I'm sure it will be discussed uh, for this week because that was a tough loss at home for Wisconsin. Yeah, Wisconsin, they can't win the big game in both college basketball and college football. They just can't win the big Ooh. game. Too soon. 